which makes it all that much harder for your opponent to play around and also lets you play some very powerful silver bullet hits like an endurance which can be really good against the graveyard based strategy. All right, this matchup seems sweet. Mani, what should people at home look out for? I think the big thing is whether Wojtek can be put in a position where he can find that endurance at instant speed and stop Gab. And how Gab is going to play around that, considering Force of Negation not that great against creatures, it may prove troublesome. All right, well, let's find out what happens. We've got Riley and Corey in the booth with this one. Take it away. Thanks very much, Maria. It's great to have your company as we get into modern. Now, my name's Riley, joined by Corey Baumeister. And Corey, I know a lot of people will be very excited to get into the back half of today's action as we move from limited into constructed. It's been a long time since we've showcased modern at the highest level like this. Yep. And uh, I can't wait to get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Hogak was uh, terrorizing back in that day. So it's been quite a while. It's my favorite format. I cannot wait to get into this. So many different decks. It's a blast to play. We're going to get stuck in as soon as our players are already down in the feature match area. And name that many people will be very familiar with, of course, Gabriel Nassif, the Frenchman, the Hall of Famer, famous for wearing his yellow hat. He doesn't have it on today, uh, as you can see there, uh, but against him, he's on uh, Living End, as we've already talked about, we have Wojtek Kowalczuk. Right. And this is a list that I'm really, really interested to, interested to see, um, the Golgari Yorgmoth list, right? One of the many cards from Modern Horizons 2 that has had a huge impact was Yorgmoth ran position. Mm. Uh, and here, Corey, it enables quite a, would you call this a complex combo? Yeah, it's definitely, it feels like a creature combo deck, you mm. know, kind of to its core. It has a lot of interaction, and of course, Yogmoth itself is such an incredible card here. Opening up with a brand new face from the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth, Delighted Halfling. This is one of the most played cards from the new set, yes. and it is an absolute powerhouse. Let's make no mistake about that. Yeah, absolutely great. One mana acceleration creature. The uncounterable aspect is not going to be super huge in this particular mm -hmm. matchup, but there's going to be a lot of matchups in modern where it is going to be super relevant. But the most important thing, in my view, on this card is that little number down in the bottom right-hand corner, that two. Yes. Right? Yes. So important. Two toughness on a mana dork in a world filled with not just Orcish Bowmasters, but also Ren and Six. Being able to keep your mana dork alive through their turn two play, really important as well. Yep, absolutely. That has made cards like Ragavan a little bit more, you know, not as format do dominating mm. as it used to be in the past. So yeah, Delighted Halfling, excellent card here. Let's have a little squeeze at what Nasif's up to here. Gab has cycled away an Oliphant as well to fetch up a mountain, and we're going to see a Curator of Mysteries hit the bin. This is what the Living End deck wants to do. If you're newer to modern, I can give you a, a, a little brief explanation as to what Living End does. It cycles away these creatures with cheap cycling abilities, and then casts Living End. Yep. Now, it doesn't suspend Living End the way that it's written on the card. It almost cheats it into play in some ways uh, using the Cascade ability of cards like Shardless Agent and Violent Outburst. We may see that, but right now we're seeing another really important card in this format, Grief. And Grief is making headlines not just in Living End, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. It's very good in a lot of different decks. Here it is mostly used to clear the way, mm -hmm. you know, clear the way of problematic cards like Endurance. Mm -hmm. That is going to be the game one card that we're really going to see from Vortec. But for now, try to get something out of the way that's going to disrupt the living end. And then when it comes back into play, you can hit some of the more powerful creatures like Yogmoth on the second time it's coming around. Yep. So, yeah, Gabriel Nassif is just trying to line up a bunch of creatures in the yard and then cast either Violent Outburst or Shardless Agent, living end those creatures back. And we do already see it in hand there. So that's a good start here for Nassif, a bit of uh, early disruption. Is that, is that good, uh, Frank, like this? Like and it enough. looks like there's really no interaction. Votek has two Endurance. Yep. You know, there's only two of the card, but you do have a bunch of Quarter Callings, uh, Evolution, stuff like that. And it looks like it's just Jam and Hope Nassif does not have it. Well, there's some bad news because Nassif not only has it, has both options here available. Uh, and most of the time you just get Shardless Agent because you get that extra body attached yeah. to it. Exactly right. The, uh, the Agent... Weirdly enough, it's such a weird, like for people who know Living End, it's like, yeah, of course, no worries. But yeah. the Shardless Agent doesn't get hit by the Living End because it's still on the stack when the Living End resolves. Yeah. You'll get there. If you're a new player, welcome to Modern. It is a Wild West format. Um, and slowly, surely, you'll, uh, you'll get across it. Don't you worry. Here's, vi here's Violent Outburst. So we're going to see a very first cascade of the weekend. Uh, Gabriel Nassif is going to look at cards or exile find? cards from the top of his library. And, oh, if he's lucky, Corey, maybe. <laughs> well, no, if, if you go and look at this deck list, you'll notice 
there are no cards that cost three or fewer than three mana, right? Yeah. What's the penalty if I oh, hang on. go I want to listen to this. and go like one past my living end? <laughs> <laughs> this is a pro to a Hall of Famer just having a chat with a judge about what happens if he stuffs up his cascade trigger. I mean, because it happens. You're going kind of fast. You know what you're going to hit. Your opponent knows what you're going to hit. And then, you know, the cards get randomly put on the bottom. So this is another scenario where we we were talking about the last round where we were in the booth, calling a judge over the yeah, but he didn't things. call a judge, Corey. He's chatting while he's resolving his trick. Well, a judge is there. A judge <laughs> so is there. Funny. Anyway, we've got the living end, so away go the three creatures here for Wojtek, unfortunately for him. But yeah, we now see the grief trigger as well as going to pick something out, the Gilded Goose, the pick. And now, Nassif, look, this is just what living in wants to do, right? He's just put four billion power into play with a three drop that he cast, and that's it. We can pack yeah. things up, go to game number three now, and this was game number two, I should say. And this is where things get really interesting. Yeah, so Living End is one of the best Game 1 decks out there. You know, this is similar to decks that we've seen like Dredge in the past, where there's a lot of hate cards coming in. You know, you have different hate cards as far as cards that interact with the graveyard, like mm -hmm. Endurance, but you also have one of the most popular cards yeah. being played this entire weekend, Chalice of the Void, to just play on zero. You will be able to counter those Cascade uh, Living End effects um, without without any problem, so Nasif would have to deal with that first and then cascade into the living end. So that is the game where Nasif is supposed to quote unquote kind of always win. And now these two post board games get a little trickier. It's really important to note that living end has a ridiculous game one win percentage, yeah. but it is a deck that I'm not going to say it's easy to, to hate out, but there, in the sense that hate always works against it. Yeah. But there are lots and lots of options and you can attack it from many different angles. So right now, we're going to see a Grief open up the proceedings for Nasif. He looks very, very happy to tear apart uh, Voitech's hand whenever he can. Nasif's hand looks great, right? Um, yeah. This is something we, we should discuss uh, while this Grief trigger resolves here, Corey. The fact that Living End now plays like 14, 15 lands because of these new cyclers from the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth. Yeah, absolutely. You Normally, you'd play kind of the normal amount of lands, 20-ish is about pretty standard for modern. But with those cyclers, you're able to not only just get basic lands like we kind of see in Limited, you're mm. able to get these dual lands mm. uh, to fix your mana even better because, well, at the end of the day, Living End is a three-color deck where if you draw too many steam vents or something like that, you're going to struggle. But with the help from these cyclers, mm. the deck is more consistent. It does kind of the same thing over and over. And if we look at kind of the sideboard of most living end decks, all it is is just anti-hate cards. Mm. You know, so it's just ways to deal with your opponent's hate cards. There's two proactive cards in the sense of Blood Moon and Leyline of the Void. Everything else, trying to blow up hate cards to make sure you can living end. Ingachua, Foundation Breaker, Force of Vigor, these are the cards that this deck has to play. It can't just play like Disenchant. Yeah. Because then the living end plan doesn't work. The yep. cascade into that would be a disaster. But this hand for, uh, for Nasifa doesn't look that impressive, but it's actually very good. We've got two Cascade cards, Violent Outburst and Shardless Agent, and we've got a effectively a second land with Oliphant, yes. right? So missing one land. That is a big deal. So we're going to see the Oliphant cycled away, get one of these dual lands, and then you have two Cyclers plus two draw steps. So you're going to draw four cards. You say missing a land, but yeah. in, in reality, between the Architects of Will, the Curator of Mysteries, and your draw step, like, you're going to find the land that you need. But it but. is a 15 land deck. So you might, you know, you kind of cheat on lands a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you might draw an Oliphant, and that is your quote unquote land. But if you draw it on turn three, you can't cascade into it immediately. And Gavin Nassif immediately making a full of Cory Bowmaster, which admittedly is not a difficult thing to do as he draws a Misty Rainforest <laughs> right off the top with the Curator of Mysteries. So the French Hall of Famer. I would say, at this point, well and truly in the driver's seat. Yes, absolutely. And now it is the pressure's on for Yawgmoth to always kind of do the Yawgmoth thing, start sacking a bunch of creatures, or find some hate, either Chalice of the Void or Endurance. Mm -hmm. But if you are able to find that, there's no counterplay to it right now from Nassif's hand. So overall, though, you're right, um, Riley. This is not a great matchup for Yawgmoth in general. It's so pretty tricky. Colney Garden, the play here for Wojtek. That's a blast from the past. We often see it. We've seen that in modern. We've seen yeah. it played in uh, Amulet Titan decks. Yep. That sort of thing. And it's, uh, it's, it's provided a little plant here for Wojtek. But a, a very quiet second turn for him. He does have the Thran Physician in hand. I believe he's sitting on a copy of Yorgmoth. Yes, I believe. 
So that'll be able to come out next turn uh, with the Gilded Goose. So you see Nassif there cycling right away. Normally you always wait, but if you were able to find something like Grief, mm -hmm. maybe you uh, want to look for another black card and then Grief right away. But as it stands, you know, this was the turn where Votek really needed to find some interaction here. And Yagmoth is okay. It gives you a couple more draws, mm. you know, to find specifically oh, well. Endurance. And the interaction Sorry. with Endurance and Living End is excellent because... Let's talk about it, yeah. Yeah, because you're able to evoke it, get rid of your opponent's graveyard with Living End on the stack, mm. and your Endurance goes to the graveyard, and then you get to bring it back. So you actually are the one who gets to gets to keep a creature in play. And, and this makes it really important for anyone who's looking to pick up and play with Living End. Sometimes you want to respond to the Cascade trigger, mm -hmm. and sometimes you want to respond to the Living End being put on the stack. Yes. In this situation with Endurance, you want to make sure that they have already cast the Living End uh, before yeah, you cast yeah, the Endurance, yeah. because then if you don't, they'll just be like, oh, I'm not going to cast my Living End. And, yeah. they'll put it back in the, and they'll put it back in the deck. Because it's a mate. You don't have to cast the, uh, the card that you Cascade into. Exactly. Yep. Very good point. Doesn't come up super often, but definitely does sometimes for sure. All right, so Mountain Cycling now, I believe, with that Oliphant hitting the bin for Nassif. He's going to be able to untap and go straight into the Shardless Agent if he chooses. What's he worried about at this situation? Just Endurance. Yeah, Absolutely. Yes. Only worried about Endurance here from Nassif's side. Uh, just hoping to fade that. And there is a lot of them. There's three now. Yeah, there's three. three. Two main, one board. But, you know, Court of Calling, not an option anymore. Mm -hmm. And it is going to only be able to draw two cards. And Votek has to draw Endurance into green cards. So, yeah. as it stands right now... Wow, um, modern and, is a fast format, we'll <laughs> say the least. And we're, we're, you know, we're kind of trying to create some drama here, but you can see with Wojtek's hand, he's sitting on Orkish Bowmasters and two thirds of absolutely nothing else. Yeah. So not looking good for yeah. the Polish player here. And that's the thing, this is a perfectly fine Yagmoth draw. You know, next turn, Wojtek easily could win the game, mm. you know, if given that time, but just not enough with how fast living end and how consistent it kind of goes off on turn three. I was talking to someone, maybe it was you, I can't remember, uh, talking about Nassif's stream. He's a great streamer as well. You can find him at Yellow Hat on, uh, on Twitch. Very good for learning. And Very good for learning how to play the game. Was it you who was telling me, it's like, oh, you know, he plays this, he plays that, he plays some nonsense, he has a good time. But when he wants to do some winning, yeah. he gets out living end. Yep, exactly. Like, we see him, he, he plays a lot of the, the challenges and stuff on the weekend and really plays living end mm. when it's time to kind of get serious. Yep. And, and you know that if he could be playing Supreme Verdicts and Teferis, he would be. Yes. You know, he'd be playing at his trademark pace, getting through Azorius control. Yep. So you know that this deck must be good in order to take it away, take him away from his beloved hallowed, hallowed fountains. All right, three mana. We're going to see a cascade here, and we're going to see Gabriel Nassif try to wrap up the game with a turn three violent outburst. What's he going to hit? There's the Ingachu. We talked about that. Yep, that was brought in. And this is open deckless, so the Chalice of the Voids were face up. Yep, yep, yep. We know that uh, they are sitting in people's sideboards, and we the players do have access to that. So, All right, here's draw number one. It's got to be green card or endurance. So this is drawing with Yorgmoth Rand Physician, right? Yes, yeah. yep, absolutely. Sacking the creature to then draw a card. So we can see there on the screen, Yorgmoth Rand Physician, pay one life, sacrifice green another card. creature. All right. One, minus one, minus one counter, and draw a card. So there's the green card. Have we found the endurance? Oh, oh my what? goodness, off the top, what? it's an endurance just like that. Wojtek is... Unbelievable. Unreal. Unbelievable draw from him. He drew green card into Endurance, the only combination of cards that got him out of that position. Unreal. And on top of that, gets to put in Endurance with the Invoke trigger, draw another card. That is ridiculous. So before it dies to the Evoke trigger, he pays another life, draws another card. That yeah. is incredible. Wojtek wow. Kowalczuk... Already, in, in this is the second game of Modern we've watched today, Corey, and Wojtek is already looking to say, no, 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 this is my format, all right? This is my uh, format. As most players do when they are on a feature match at the pro level, you always watch back your match. You know, you want to kind of see it. Nassif's going to watch back yeah. and probably not love <laughs> He's not going to love it. Wojtek, although, let's, let's, let's all say day to Wojtek, who's yeah. re-watching this back at home a couple of days later. He's having a great time. He's having the time of his life. Yes. Holy moly. And Wojtek really stayed really stoic about it because, you know, Nassif doesn't know that you needed that exact Oh, no, he had it the there. whole time, dude. Yeah. He, had, he was just playing correctly, you know. Oh, yep, sacrifice this, trigger that, no worries. <laughs> I had this the whole time, dude. Let's Let's go. Wow. Let's go. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it, he says. Yeah. And that other, was incredible. The other thing about uh, endurance that is just so backbreaking here for Nassif, right? Like, if it were a counter spell, and they say, like, all right, whatever, I'll just cascade next yeah. turn. Look at his graveyard. 
He's got nothing to bring back anymore. Exactly. So if he cascades again, hits another copy of Living End, he's bringing back uh, nothing. Yeah. And there is some scenarios where you have the Living End on the stack, and if you do get Endurance, you first let that trigger resolve, yeah. and then you start cycling again. But he was out of mana. Yeah, but when, it, when it's late game, you can kind of do that stuff. But here, of course, I like the play as well. Just go for it. Force Votek to have it, and uh, did. Just ridiculous here. Gabriel on a safe. Taking an absolute <laughs> shellacking here from Wojtek, who is not here to make friends, dude. <laughs> Ripping the green card and the endurance. What a series of draws for him. Yeah, we'll have to get Frank to type up the odds on that one, because that was... Uh... Uh, the steam will be coming off his calculator as we speak as he figures that one out. Holy moly. All right, let's have a look at what's in the safe's hand. Let's see if he's got any more business. He's got that uh, Shardless Agent. He's got an Oliphant, mm -hmm. so he can put something in the bin. Subtlety and Force of Negation here, the other cards that typically you're wanting to use to protect what you're doing rather yes. than playing them reactively. You're sort of wanting to play them proactively. So in a seat, not the best spot right now. Yeah, not the best at all. And honestly, Force of Negation is a card that I'm kind of surprised it's even left in. There's only Quarter Calling and Eldritch Evolution mm -hmm. as your targets. You do, of course, have those two Chalice of the Voids that you can hit, but that really puts the pressure on you to have it right away, because Chalice, you immediately cast. You know, there's some thought to playing around Foundation Breaker and maybe holding it for a little bit later to play the Chalice, mm. but most of the time you just jam it, have the least amount of chance of yeah. Nasif having Force. All right. Well, both of these cards now are going to be uh, de yeah, deployed yeah. here as we see Thinking. the yeah. uh, Subtlety cast with the Force Pitched. Yep. Uh, targeting, that's an Orcish Bowmasters hanging Correct. out there. That's still on the stack. Uh, or it's, or I think I think Wojtek is considering whether to put it on top or below deck. Yep, exactly. And the one nice thing that yeah, I would do true. here with the with a fetch land in play is put it on top and you can always change your mind. Yeah. You can always sacrifice the land and shuffle it away later if you want, no. depending on how it works. But Riley, even look at this. As it's standing right now, you know, Nasif is at 10, so a little bit of a precarious life total. But as it stands, you can just cycle Oliphant and then that Shardless Agent. Yeah. It's still going to deal with the creatures. You're going to have to deal with Yawgmoth coming back, mm. but you're still going to get a nice little battlefield mm -hmm. from Nasif's side and still be in this game, well, even he, though we had this crazy interaction He has earlier. to do something. He's on five, right? Like, he has yeah. to do something here. So cycles away the Oliphant. Um, I, I bet he wishes that weren't an Oliphant. Yeah. Right now, like he would have take basically any other cycler there because yes. he would want to cycle into another cycler. Yeah. Anytime you have the prerequisite amount of mana, yeah. you really don't, uh, you know, necessarily want these. But it still goes to show just how powerful these one mana land cyclers are in this deck yeah. because if that were just a mountain in his hand, Nasif would be in a very bad, like a really, really bad spot. At exactly. least, at least, and he's bringing back the subtlety as well. So this actually isn't the worst living end here if Nasif decides to go for it. So far, you know, we still have a draw step here. We could chain together a couple of cyclers True. and really start, uh, right. you know, getting more stuff here. Prismatic command or Prismari command, not exactly what you wanted here. No, Prismari command isn't going to aid him too much. But again, a really another another really key card post board, mm -hmm. the shatter effect to destroy Chalice, and yep. also the looting effect, right? Draw to discard two. Really useful way to make sure the graveyard's nice and full while enacting your game plan. Exactly. Three mana. Now we're going to see Shardless Agent, I imagine, a transplant from Legacy. A Legacy uh, staple for a long time before it made the jump to uh, Modern in Modern Horizons 2. And now Nasif going through the motions and going to flip a Living End in order to try to run back his success in game number one. Here it is. And let's see what Voitech's response is this time. Um, the Young Wolf comes back, correct? Yep. Or, or is it exiled to the uh, Nope, that the should end? come back. I think it comes back, right? I know oh. the, the Living End exiles cards yeah. from the graveyard, uh, yeah, but yeah, not from right. the battlefield. Uh, you, sac yes. you sacrifice them. Sacrifice them. Yep, absolutely. So yep. we'll get the Young Wolf back and Yawgmoth here. So that is... That's a good start, That's man. a really good start. Then all you really need is one more Young Wolf, and now you can draw a card for each life you have as long as you're kind of ahead on the battlefield. Um, that that's going to mean a lot of cards being drawn. From what we saw, I don't believe we have a ton of action in hand. For Wojtek? Yes. No, I don't think it's so. It's just Besaidu in another land. Yep. So Wojtek here, very carefully working out what his response to this living end, which I believe is still on the stack. It is, yeah. Just looking like we're just is looking to... Uh, no, just make a food. Oh, a food type. Yeah. Okay, sure. If he even wants to, doesn't look like you want. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep, so back comes the Young Wolf. That touches the graveyard very briefly before the Undying Trigger brings it back. And Yorgmoth, of course, coming back for another round of the Lunch Buffet after the Living End uh, returns him to the battlefield. As for Nasif, Subtlety and Oliphant coming back from the bin and that Shardless Agent hitting the battlefield after the Living End has resolved. So the Frenchman has managed to put a board back together. But look, win, lose or draw, an iconic moment. <laughs> for Wojtek before. That was who boy. We're oh, not, not yeah. going to be forgetting about that green card into Endurance draw for a long time. Yeah, that was incredible there. And now you kind of play these weird games with Living End where you're just kind of getting into combat with, you know, some just mid-range creatures here. So I was going to say before, with the Young Wolf, right, yep. all Wojtek really needs is another creature in order to, like, start the draw engine. Not, not kickstart it in the way that you would with another Young Wolf. Yeah. But he can, he can get a, a really good amount of value out of this. And he didn't even need a creature. He had a fetch land, Dryad Arbor, easy peasy. Exactly. So now that kind of equates to two cards, no matter what. You mm -hmm. sack the Dryad Arbiter, you target the Young Wolf. And found, then, an, a, uh, found an Eldritch Evolution there. Sorry, Corey. Okay. Yep. Perfect. That's huge. That's huge. Eldritch Evolution can sacrifice the Young Wolf. You can go get powerful cards like Grist, just to name uh, uh, a few to start. You, you can just get another Young Wolf as well, I believe. All right, we'll see what we do here. Orcish Bowmaster off the top as well. And a Thought Seize. Yeah, definitely huge advantage here to Votek. Okay, so three mana. Now, Eldritch Evolution um, brings back the Young Wolf after its... Uh, so, oh, sorry, the Undying Ring play brings back the Young Wolf. Uh, and now he can go and say, oh, look, there's, there's that uh, Chalice of the Void right at the bottom right of the, the library. <laughs> Finds that Patra. Talk to us about this card. This is, a, this is a spicy inclusion. Yeah, this is a spicy one. So being able to kind of go off here, every minus one, minus one counter that you get onto a creature, you mm. get a snake. So then you sack that snake, put a minus counter on Young Wolf, and you just keep this going here. It's really important uh, to note for perhaps players who aren't familiar with the Undying mechanic and with plus one, plus one, and minus one, minus one counters. Yeah. You can put all sorts of different counters on creatures, right? You can put stun counters, whatever, and they all kind of just stack up however. Yep. The exception is minus one, minus one counters, and plus one, plus one counters, they cancel each other out. Yeah. So if you have a creature with a plus one, plus one counter, you put a minus one, minus one counter on it. No counter. That's it. Yep. And now we've just seen Wojtek take out a game that he had no business winning, <laughs> no business whatsoever after that incredible series of draws, yeah. and then able to search out the Hepatra with the, uh, with the Eldritch Evolution that you drew off the Dryad Arbor. Textbook stuff from him. Love to see it. Really impressive stuff. Votek was already ready to be like, all right, 3-1, not a bad record yeah. here. <laughs> instead, the perfect two cards. I love that it was the Young Wolf first that we saw, yeah. that you needed the endurance afterwards, the extra sweat, yeah. if you will. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was a terrific uh, se sequence there for Wojtek, who gets himself a game three as a result. A mulligan for the poll uh, as he... Starts the game on six cards. Nasif looks to have a, a decent enough opener here, Corey. A really great opener, especially in the sense that there is an ingot chewer to be able to blow up the chalice that Votek has. So uh, Votek kept that hand based on the power yeah. of chalice. And now as long oh, as boy. Nasif can find the lands, which yeah. is not guaranteed right now. Oh, we do have the Oliphant. So, yeah, it's already guaranteed yeah. for two lands, which is huge. Yep. So Wojtek plays the Chalice of the Void on zero. That means that it will counter uh, any zero mana spells that are cast. Yep. Living End, of course, the uh, the key one that's going to be taken out. But Nasif, uh, with Oliphant to get a mountain, yep. can, can evoke this Ingot Chewer. And uh, the Ingot Chewer's uh, Shatter Effect takes it, care of the Chalice. Exactly. And we saw the previous game where we're like, okay, we really wish this Oliphant was a different cycler to kind of channel him in. Yeah. That could spell a nightmare scenario in this scenario if you just drew a card and you don't draw land. So yeah. this is really showing the power of these basic land cyclers. I think that they, yeah, they are just so much better because they enable this deck to take a much more consistent, consistent approach to uh, enacting its combo. The fact that they don't just draw dead lands uh, off the top when they're needing business. Yeah. Uh, Oliphant is uh, a lot better to have yes. in your bin than a mountain sitting in your hand. And so for that reason, yeah, I think the, the Living End decks have been given a huge shot in the arm. Quarter calling off the top now for Wojtek, who is sitting on a hand that really doesn't look that great. Taka, no. Takanuma 
Yorgmoth, caught a calling, and a whole lot of nothing else. Yep, completely slow. The only reason to keep that hand was the power of Chalice. So really up against it here. Now we'll see if Nassif draws a land to be able to just go for Living End straight away. Doesn't look like it, so we're going to see some cycling to supercharge this Living End, which means Vortec has exactly one turn to draw something spicy. We've seen it before. We yeah, might we, see we it again. We might see it again, dude. <laughs> Stripe Riverwinder hits the bin here as Nassif uh, cycles looking for a land. Can he find it? No, he draws another river winder. I think we're going to see another cycle. He wants to hit this third land drop. Yep, absolutely. And you want to do it now because you want to play the land. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's why it's main phase here because yeah. uh, Nasif is looking for that land. And he finds it too. He's found a steam. It. And now you can take a little bit of damage and cycle again mm -hmm. to maximize. Now there is some point when you're like, well, my graveyard is already so impressive. I don't really need yeah. anymore. Six creatures. I think yeah. you're, getting, you're getting close to that point here and now, I think. Exactly. But no, Nasif, he's... He's hungry, dude. He's hungry. He wants some more creatures in there. Let's go. Shocks himself with the uh, the steam vents. That's an original steam vents as well, all the way back to Ravnica. Beautiful. Yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. favorite. That's oh, my I, favorite I, tend, I tend to go for the return to Ravnica. That's the time that I started getting into competitive magic. So I got ah. a real soft spot for the um, RTR Gate Crash Dragon's okay. Maze era okay. ones. But look, all of them are all of them are classics. These, a little these... biased to yourself. I see. I see. It's okay to be wrong, you know. Look. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh no. How terrible for me to have a personal bias, Corey. <laughs> So the one thing that we do have going here for Nasif as well is now Nasif can play around the endurance with the subtlety here. Yes. So can yeah. go for it and subtlety, uh, which is going to you know provide a lot of insurance here. Doesn't look like we have. He's got the, the he's got the insurance insurance. Endurance insurance exactly because really needed it last game. I'll he tell did. you. And that. he didn't have it and he was caught out. Exactly. He was caught out. He's not making that mistake again, Corey. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Absolutely. So there was really one out for this game to basically not end. End next turn, and that was the case Chalice of the Void, mm -hmm. since there is two in the board. And as it stands now, yep. that game two is going to be an awesome story for Votech to show to his friends, yep. but unfortunately will not materialize into a match win. I don't think uh, so here. Nasif is able to untap with a graveyard that is absolutely stacked. He's got the Violent Outburst. He's got the Subtlety and a blue card and Architects of Will to back it up. And I think Nasif is about to put about four billion power into play with this living end and a stack graveyard. And yeah. for, Wojtek doesn't even get a consolation prize. He doesn't have anything in the bin. Nope, nothing in the bin. You can court a calling here for zero to get Dryad Arbiter. That's kind of the big thing. And Nassif can just let this happen and then um, go for the Violent Outburst, which will then get into Living End. But Nassif okay. does not know that there's not two Endurances, for instance, yeah. and two green cards. So yeah. that is what he has to fade right now. Um, and of course, you got to be worried about it because that's the only thing that could happen. Well, look, and last time we were like, oh no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then Voitech's yeah. like, no, no, I got it. So yeah, <laughs> the safe sitting there thinking, like, all right, does he have double young wolf, double endurance? What's this guy made of? <laughs> yeah, exactly. See that nice graveyard shot here to be able to check out exactly what the hits are. Mm -hmm. Looks like a couple of striped river winders. We've got that Inga Chua that was doing some work before. Two, uh, two curator of mysteries and the elephant that was key in making sure that Nasif hit his land drops. So here's the Dryad Arbor. But it's Nasif's turn now, and he doesn't hesitate in tapping three mana, and Violent Outburst goes onto the stack. Cascade yep. Trigger. Yep, and Nasif did this in the proper order because, well, Dryad Arbiter comes into play, can't activate or can't use itself for mana because it is summoning sick, yep. and gets the value of killing the Dryad Arbiter with the Living End as well. It's minor since you're bringing back the world from the graveyard, yep. but still it is the proper way to do it. Uh, Nasif is definitely all about making the correct play. And you can see that he's being very careful. He doesn't want to overflip here. He doesn't <laughs> want to flip past the uh, the living end. He's already asked the judge about that. But it's only a matter of time before he hits the namesake card of this deck. Living end onto the stack here. Wojtek is going to be forced to let that card resolve. And Gabriel Nassif, oh, we are going to need to ba bust out the uh, hypergeometric calculator here to figure out exactly what, exactly how much power. I don't, do numbers go this high, dude? I don't believe they do. No. Nope, nope absolutely too far. And, I mean, half these creatures have hexproof. Like, yeah. it just becomes it's too It's not much. happening, man. It's not happening. <laughs> Listen, I want to take a moment to salute Wojtek Kowalczuk for giving us the show of a lifetime. What a game two from him. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there is no shame in going down to a player of the caliber of yeah. Gabriel Nassif, the French Hall of Famer, winning a game that, oh boy, a match that Corey that I think will live very long in the memory. That was a pleasure yeah. to watch and a pleasure to have your company as well as we get stuck into modern. So much more 
for us to get stuck into, Corey. Yep. Uh, your thoughts as we wrap up our first game here? You know, the thoughts that I have mainly from this match is this is what Modern's all about. There's always these really high impact cards that you can draw off the top, so games get to be so exciting. So if you were a fan of that, Stay tuned for the rest of the broadcast because Modern is chock full of those kind of interactions and I just can't wait to uh, see the rest of them. A lot more where that came from, so I hope you're hungry because we're going to get stuck into it very, very shortly. But right now, back to Maria who's going to preview our next match. Hey everybody, don't go anywhere. Coming up next, we have Min Yang Chen versus Yuki Ichikawa's. That's Team Rhinos versus Four Color Omnath. Chen is on Team Rhinos, another one of the Cascade decks in the format, trying to use Shardless Agent and Violent Outburst, this time going into Crashing, crashing Footfalls to put a large board presence into play. Now, this deck is being backed up by a lot of interaction in the forms of Mystical Dispute, Force of Negation, Subtlety, and Brazen Borrower, all cards that get around the restriction with this Cascade deck of not costing less than three. On the other side, we have Yuki Ichikawa on one of the most played decks in the field, the four-color Omnath deck. Now, this is the mid-range deck of the format, and with new tools, Delighted Halfling and the One Ring really leveling up this deck, it, you can see why it is so vastly played. This deck is trying to use the Halfling to power out an uncounterable powerhouse like Red and Six, Omnath, or Teferi Time Ta Traveler, and that is going to be the big one in this matchup, as not only does an uncountable Teferi get around all of the counter spells from Chen, but it also stops the Cascade ability. So this is going to be a tough one for Rhinos. That's Rhinos v Omnath coming up after this. Hello, hello everyone and welcome back to Barcelona here for Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings continued coverage from our feature match area. Riley and I joined by Corey Baumeister and it's great to have your company here in Spain as we explore the modern format for the first time in a very long time on Magic's oh, yeah. biggest stage. Corey, we've just seen Gabriel Nassif take out uh, Wojtek Kowalczyk living in, getting the job done. We know that it's going to be a very powerful deck this weekend, but Definitely. it's time to move on to our second feature match and look at some different lists here. We've already met our players, Ming Yang Chen and Yuki Ichikawa. Ichikawa, probably a familiar face for many. This bloke has been around the traps for a long time. Uh, Ming, Ming Yang Chen, uh, uh, probably someone who could be an up and comer. Yep, absolutely. Maybe not as many main results, but top f or five top finishes for Yuki Ichikawa, very established. And the thing that I love about Modern, once again, is we see 
two different decks in round one, two different decks here. That is just really what Modern is all about. The highest played deck being 19%. We're gonna see a lot of different matchups, a lot of different interactions, and this matchup is no different. Let's get stuck in here, meet our players, learn a little bit more about them. Yuki Ichikawa, of course, been around for a long time. Five top finishes, over $183,000 in prize money, and uh, he was the Innistrad champion winner as well. Yep. yep. Golgari Food, remember that? He, he got it done, that man. That was a good one. He got it done. <laughs> uh, on the other side of the table, Mingyang Chen uh, won at a regional championship in China. And we're getting stuck in here, both of these players playing, hey, brand new cards, Lord of the yes. Rings, Sailor Middle Earth. They are, that is making its presence felt in modern. So here's the big thing. Yuki has an absolutely overpowered draw if you can go Delighted Halfling into Teferi Time Raveler against the Cascade deck. That's exactly what you want to be doing. Chain's going to have a really forced thing if you have fire, yeah. which it is there. That there is, is a must kill immediately. Yeah, so let's talk about the Rhino's deck. It has a very similar game plan to Living End, right? Yep. It doesn't cycle creatures into the bin, but it still looks to resolve Cascade spells. These are typically, as we've seen before, ca uh, cards like Shardless Agent. Some cards, mm -hmm. some of these decks are even playing um, Exalted, the uh, Ardent Plea, the Exalted card. Yep, yep. There's a little bit of four color there. They're also playing Leyline Binding. Another way to get around that Cascade, mm -hmm. you know, requirement of having to pay play cards that cost more than three, since Leyline Binding costs one most of the time, um, but it gets around the Cascade mechanic. But yeah, the main difference here from Rhinos, from Living End, is Rhinos gets to play a lot more interaction, a lot more removal, mm. instead of, you know, the quote-unquote bad creatures that you have to cycle away that aren't really great at doing any other job besides cycling. And I'm looking here at uh, at this list that Chen is playing. Really, really interesting. Two copies of Brazen Borrower, not something we see all the time. Yep. Three copies of Mystical Dispute main deck as well. Yep, that's a really nice card here, and here it is. I also saw from Ichikawa had to ferry, but since the Delighted Halfling was dealt with, yeah. now does not have the mana to deploy it. And once you play Teferi after the Rhinos have already resolved, it's a huge difference and a whole different story. It's still not terrible because you can bounce one of the Rhinos, yep. but yeah, like the, before this just would have been a three mana 2-2 two -two with no abilities if the Teferi yes. were on the, uh, on the battlefield. But now three mana, 10 power, <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, and wow, I see Force, Merc Tide, and a Subtlety, so... Oh, dude, forget Oh, it. man. Chen has everything on lockdown here. Yeah, Chen absolutely in the, in the driver's seat here. That Lurian revealed really important in making sure that he had his land drops all yes. sorted and ready to go. Another important card. I'm sure we'll get the chance to talk about that. But right now, Ichikawa, what's he going to do about this? Probably um, cry, you know. I think uh, being able to play Teferi and then getting it forced with this absolutely powerful draw from Chen, this yep. is the ideal draw from the Team of Rhinos deck. And there it is. Teferi uh, is going to be exiled by the Force of Negation. Merktide Regent yep. being pitched to Force of Negation. And now, back to Chen, who was untapped yep. with these Rhinos, untouched by anything such as a Teferi Minus. Yep. So he's about to rumble. And here's another thing. We see another violent outburst in the hand. Normally, you're like, I don't want to overextend against a possible Supreme Verdict. That is not in this list, and it's oh, not dude, really it's common not a, in, it's not any in this of the format, list. man. No, exactly. one's, no one's playing Supreme Verdict. RIP, best sweeper ever printed. Holy moly. Yep. So yeah, now, my so dirty. now, as it stands, this is 13 damage. So, I yep. mean, you could, <laughs> Ichikawa is already going down to one. Plus, then there's going to be eight more power on the battlefield with a second crashing footfall. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of all done here. <laughs> we can wrap <laughs> things up pretty shortly. We don't actually often see violent outbursts, non-cascade text having any relevance, but here it's actually doing something, yes. right? It's yes. like put two 4-4s four into play, give my creatures plus one plus oh, an extra three points of damage. Ichikawa has seen enough, and we are going to game two. Miss, blink and you'll miss it magic here in Barcelona. Yeah. And Team of Rhinos, similar to Living End, has that similar very good game one and then gets a lot worse. Mm -hmm. We see another two Chalice of the Voids gets collateral damage against Living End and Rhinos uh, as another card to bring in. Not a lot of other cards that are being brought in from the four color side. There's two Dovin's Vetoes, which are very nice at fighting through counter spells mm -hmm. to deal with the Rhinos no matter what. Yeah. But outside of that... Like Endurance Yuki, endurance isn't doing anything. Endurance doesn't do anything. Those will be taken out. Yuki Ichikawa's plan is to actually just answer these Rhinos on a one-for-one -one basis with Prismatic Ending, Solitude, Bounce with Teferi, mm. and play, you know, one of our new cards, the One Ring, to gain some protection and card advantage. We haven't seen the One Ring just yet in, uh, in Modern, but I'm sure 
sure we will. It is going to be a big talking point this weekend. This card has been absolutely bonkers so yep. far. So I'm sure we're going to get it. To, uh, we're going to see it get some work done. But uh, I want to talk about uh, Chalice of the Void, right? Yes. Chalice of the Void already we've seen in both the matches that we've watched. Really important card. But there's a point I want to make about Four Color Omnath. Yes. Yep. Chalice of the Void in many decks is brought in. You play it for zero, right? And it turns off Living Ends, mm -hmm. Rhinos, whatever. One of the best things about this Four Color Omnath deck is they can play it for one. They can play yeah. Chalice of the Void. They can put two mana into it, one counter on it, and they just take out the Halflings or, like, leave them in, whatever, right? Yeah. And it doesn't hamper the deck against, is it Murktide, against uh, even Rakdos, right? Turns yeah. off their one drops. This is a really, really important angle, angle of attack and something that really draws me to this Omnath deck as, yep. I mean, it's already so powerful, but a really important interactive avenue for this deck to take with Chalice. Totally agree. It has a lot of collateral damage against other kind of fringe deck like Death Shadow, Jeskai yep. Breach really yep. hurts those decks as well quite a bit. And, I mean, with this deck, you can get so much mana available that at times, when you've already established a battlefield, you can Chalice of the Void for, like, four against Yawgmoth to shut down Yawgmoth itself. So the card is very versatile in four-color Omnath specifically. Yeah. Most of the other decks can't generate that kind of mana um, like this deck can with Omnath. I love this deck, man. You put me onto <laughs> it when we were preparing for the event. You sent, yeah. sent me that list. It was so sick, and I was playing it. It's just like, it just feels so powerful. Yes. It's just, it's one of those decks that, like, it's really exciting every time you get to your draw step because you know you're going to draw something good. Exactly. There's just no bad cards in the list. Yeah, it's, it's very much the control deck of the format, yeah, which sure. feels kind of strange. You know, normally there's some kind of blue-white control deck, Esper control. Counterspell sweepers. Counterspell, yeah. Supreme Verdicts. Just not really how the texture of modern is right now, so this ends up being the go-to deck for all those control lovers. Brazen. Celestial Colonnade enjoyers, oh, if you right. will. Yeah, man. <laughs> you were getting stuck in. I was talking about Celestial Colonnade, my one true love yesterday, and oh yeah. my goodness, Corey would not. As if you're any less of a modern boomer than I am, man. Well, Get out of town. I mean, that's extra boomer status right, right there, okay. you know? All right. Well, look, there's, it's all, no, all, all Zoomers, no boomers today <laughs> as we see crashing footfalls come down again. Yeah. Brazen Borrower removed the uh, the Ren from the battlefield, bouncing it to the hand. And now we've just got an easy peasy cascade here. Yeah, and no play there on turn three from Ichikawa. Not ideal by any means. Fetching the land, we could have an Omnath available here as a blocker. Not ideal. Omnath, you really want to cast when you can then play a fetch land. Yeah. Because even in matchups like this, where you're not necessarily needing the mana if you just need to buy time, mm -hmm. you can go fetch land, gain four, say go, crack, put a land into play, gain four, gain four. You know, and that stabilizes against the Rhinos straight away. Well, let, let's get into it here, because yeah. we're, we're seeing Ichikawa uh, think about what he's actually going to cast. I, I suspect it'll be an Omnath, but there are actually a number of lines you can take with Omnath that are, that are really important to, for people to note, right? Yeah. Omnath is... Oh, it's Teferi instead. Okay. There's it's, the Force again. Oh, dude. Oh, my oh. goodness. Forget <laughs> it. Holy moly. You just cannot get a Teferi on the battlefield for love no money. Yeah. So instead, Fury evoked with that Ren and Six that was bounced. That's going to remove one of the Rhinos here, but Ichikawa would have been hoping to get rid of both of them. Yeah, and these decks in the past have kind of run that ephemerate trick where you can really kind of go crazy with these yeah. evoke cards, but no longer in the deck, not really needed. They do play more like a control deck. It's got another violent outburst here. This is that gonna, good? Yeah, it's, <laughs> pre it's pretty good, Corey. I would say, in my expert opinion, I'd say it's pretty good. Another crashing footfalls. Two more rhinos come down. So Chen in well and truly in the driver's seat here. It's up to Ichikawa to try to find his way back into this game now. Yep. In for five. And look at the pace that Chen's playing. I love the confidence. I love the confidence this, that, that this guy is sitting there yeah. with. He, he obviously knows his deck in and out. Absolutely. And there we go. That is All one right. card that can protect in this scenario. <laughs> Here are the really popular play patterns with this deck. All right, hit it. First, play the one ring, gain protection, draw a card. Yep. Untap, draw two, and be like, okay, now look at your hand. Do I have the ability to then maintain the battlefield? If you do, great. The game continues. Mm -hmm. If not, you're in trouble. So you do have four draws to be able to find something like, you know, Omnath into Solitude, for instance. That would be pretty strong at maintaining the battlefield. But one thing about the One Ring in a four-color Omnath, you really need to gain life to prevent it from, you know, killing you. Teferi can bounce it, which helps mm -hmm. a lot. But for the most part, 
you know, you need to keep the ring around for quite a while until you gain a lot of card advantage. And, and this is what I wanted to talk about as we see Ice uh, tap down that breeding pool by the look of things. Yep. One of the really important things about Omnath in this list is that it is a re repeatable, mannerless way to gain a ton of life. And there are a bunch of different ways that different decks approach to, to uh, dealing with the burden counters on the ring. <laughs> yep. But a lot of the time, the Omnath deck can just outrace it. Yes, it absolutely can. It 100% can. Gaining eight life a turn cycle with the uh, pat, the play pattern that you talked about before, Corey. Yep. A fetch land on my turn, crack it on your turn. That's seven life, mm -hmm. and uh, and you you can you can race. I suppose it's weird to talk about racing your own cards, but yeah. that's one of the things <laughs> that Omnath can do with the one ring. Yep, 100%. And when you're drawing that many cards, the nice thing with this four color uh, Omnath deck is you draw these free spells. Yeah, the pitch so cards, yeah, yeah sure. you can just have some turns where you cast three four spells off four mana. The final point I want to make about Omnath and its triggered abilities with Landfall is the fact that you play the you play the fetch land, you crack it on your turn, yep. you generate four mana. What costs four mana, Corey? The one ring. The one ring. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go from a position where you're pretty behind on board into Omnath, fetch land, play the one ring, and all of a sudden you're back in it. Now we're saying we're seeing the play the cards played in the opposite sequence this time, the one yep. ring into Omnath, but Ichikawa back in this game. I think Ichikawa is actually going to lose on the spot right now. I Never saw mind. <laughs> I, I, I withdraw everything that I was saying because Corey is here to absolutely pants me. So, so Corey Baumeister, tell us what's about what it's about to happen. So there, there was an amazing play by Chen. They're icing down a land to make it so this Omnath was taxed a little bit. So Yuki Ichikawa had to sack a land to put Omnath into play. So now there is a Brazen Borrower in hand so you can petty theft this Omnath in response to the fetch, attack with your Rhinos, and the only thing I saw in hand for Yuki Ichikawa was Ren, Delighted Halfling, Dovin's Veto. And as long as Chen yep. times this correctly, it's easy because you get to attack. Omnath blocks. Now Ichikawa is going to sack, bounce, In response game. to that. And it's got trample. <laughs> and that is that. Holy moly. That was some incredible sequencing from Chen. And, and yes. one thing, again, I want to draw attention to, his confidence. He was playing at a blistering pace. Yes. The speed of light, right? And you look at that situation. Okay, one ring, Omnath. But you, Eagle Eyes Corey over here, spots. <laughs> the petty theft, the brazen borrower, and that made all the difference. Yeah, really knows his deck inside and out. You can very clearly tell by those play patterns and the speed, and just drew the higher end of the draws with that deck. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, games just can look absolutely non-competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is these Cascade decks are really polarizing in the sense that they really crush you, or sometimes they get really crushed and it doesn't look like they're playing Magic. I want to defend my position. Yeah. I want to you, made me, do. you made me look Please like do. an idiot, and that's fine. You know, I make myself <laughs> look like an idiot, so it's only fair that someone else gets a yes, chance to. Yes, of course. But I think Ichikawa in that situation, he's like, right, breathe out. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Got the Omnath, got a, a life gain trigger. I think I'm going to be okay here. Yeah. But no, because of that ice that you mentioned, because of the fact that he's sitting on this petty theft, masterful stuff from Chen. I hope we get yeah. to see more of him playing. Yeah, the ice was actually kind of the nail in the coffin there, because even if Yugi Ichikawa just went fetch land down to six, block yeah. up to ten, mm takes eight, and then the ring would have still dealt with them in the draw step. So that ice was low-key, the card that got it. We're yeah. going to be able to move on now. We can move on to our next feature match. We've got a third one coming your way here. Simon Nielsen, the man with a big old smile. You never see yes. this bloke having a bad day against Bart Van Etten. These are two European superstars. They've been around for a long, long, long time, as you can see. Yep. And we're going to get stuck into Demir Control versus Mono Green Tron. And two more new decks. We've had yep. three matches, six different decks. This is what Modern's all about. And this deck is what this Pro Tour is all about because Team Handshake, arguably the best team right now, especially with looking at Pro Tour March of the Machine, mm -hmm. going one, two, three, four in the last Pro Tour, a lot of them played Tron. A lot of them. Now, this is not your granddaddy's uh, Tron deck anymore, <laughs> dude. Khan Liberated? Yeah. Khan who? It, it, Khan, that's a one of. It's Khan the great creator now. Yeah, exactly. It's all about the four drop. Khan. Khan, Khan Liberated has been a mainstay of Tron for about 10 million years. Yeah. But now it's all about that Khan wishboard, dude. Yeah, and here's a new addition to the deck that we haven't seen a lot, Urza Saga. For sure. Something we don't see very much at all. I mean, here's another new card. We have the Golgari Talisman. Mm -hmm. um, really cool stuff here. Um, I, I talked with Javier yesterday, and 
a lot of the numbers look really strange. There's three Sylvan scrying, for instance. Yeah. I was kind of asking, like, oh, did you not get enough Sylvan scryings at the vendors? <laughs> they weren't selling enough? Like, that's a card you would just automatically think that this is what Instant is in Tron. Instant for of. But what he was saying is, when they were building Tron, the one thing they said is, forget everything we've known about it and start looking at the deck in a different light. And they came up with a really unique deck that, of course, still plays the core, four of each as a land, and uh, some bigger colorless stuff, but... Some of the minute details is a lot different. It's kind of the same as Living End, right? Like, Living yeah. End is enacting the same game plan, cascade into Living End, put a bunch of creatures into play, but the way that they do that has changed. I think it's mm -hmm. fair to say that Tron is trying to do the same thing on one axis, right? It's trying to get three lands into play that tap for seven mana. Yeah. And what it does with that mana is now very different. Cedric was making the point to us earlier today that it's an eight mana deck now. It's not a seven yeah. mana deck, you know? It plays Khan and then something out of the board. It plays Cityscape Leveler. Whatever it's trying to do, it's not... It's not the deck that won the, the Mythic Championship last time we were here in Barcelona. Yeah. Right? It's, it's the same concept, conceptually, right? It's in the same yeah. cinematic universe. Exactly. But it's a very, very different style of Tron. Yeah, Javier said a sentence to me that, like, you know, just blew me back so much. He's like, Tron is a control deck now. I was like, excuse me, sir? <laughs> uh, pardon me, what? Yeah. <laughs> On the other side of things, speaking of control decks, let's talk about this Demir control list. This is a list that's kind of come out of left field recently. Yep. Um, a deck that... Uh, I think we can <clears throat> diplomatically say has had been met with some mixed opinions. Yes. There are some people who think it is the next big thing. There are some people that think it is something that's been fished out of a garbage can. I am waiting to see what happens. I think it's got a lot of potential, but uh, I want to see what these pros have got up their sleeves with this list. Yeah, absolutely. And it plays so many new cards from the most recent set. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have Lauren Revealed, Orcish Bowmasters, Sor uh, Sauron's Ransom, and the One Ring. I mean, that is a lot of cards in a modern format. Yeah. You know, you don't see that often. You see maybe one of these options. So it's really hard to tell how good this deck is because it's very, very new, like you were saying. All right, let's get into what's been going on here. We've got a thought seize to reveal Nielsen's hand. We can have a look that he's got some absolute bangers in hand in the one ring. O-Stone as well. And Khan Liberated. Gone but not forgotten. Here he is. And Haywire Might. Let's talk about this card, Corey. Wait, are we actually saying that Khan Liberated now is the one of fun of here? I mean, it gotta seems, love it. It seems like it, right? But <laughs> yeah. talk to us about Haywire hey, hey, Might because that's actually a really important card in this format. Haywire Might not only is a very important card in the format, as far as the team handshake players, it's the most important card in their sideboard, which their sideboard is full of one ofs, except one two of, which is a Haywire Might, so you can actually bring one of them in as an Urza Saga target. You know, when you draw it, I guess that's a little bit different here, but yeah, incredible at dealing with a lot of different hate cards. It deals with the one ring that's for simple. opposing players. Yep. And so does Karn the Great Creator. So this is not only the best the One Ring deck, but it is the best anti the One Ring deck. And the One Ring is the most played card at 450 copies. So Bart thought this is the way the Haywire might. The reason the Haywire might is so important, of course, is because it exiles an artifact or enchantment. Yep. And the One Ring being indestructible, it is not exile proof. Urza Saga goes up to three, and now Nilsson will have to decide what to do with it. He's already made one Khan Struct, as we often call them, these uh, tokens that yep. have their power and toughness equal to how many artifacts you have. And you do get to decide before you draw, which is very helpful in this deck. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say we just peel off Urza's Mine here, which is going to complete uh, the trifecta here of Urza lands. Then, of course, you're like, yeah, I don't really mind doing an Urza Saga here. But if you don't draw a land, now Simon has to make a real decision here whether or not you want to use that Urza Saga mana to... Um, sack the map and accomplish Tron, which it looks like Simon's going for, or make another creature. I like this choice as the Demir control deck has a lot of creature removal, whether or not it's all left in from Bart. That's a different story. So yeah, Cracks the Expedition map, the one that was just freshly cast. I'm just thinking, I don't think I've ever seen a talisman of anything cast in a non-commander game of Magic before. Yeah, not really. Like, I presume this card was legal in Standard or some ancient format <laughs> 10,000 years ago, but I've actually never seen a mana rock like this <laughs> cast in a game of competitive constructive magic, right? It's always, it's just a Commander All-Star, of course, like all yeah. the two-drop mana, uh, two mana rocks are. Yeah, not exactly a staple here. And it is a one-of as well, so they really finesse the numbers yeah, oh, it's on very, this it's one. It's highly but... scientific, highly <laughs> scientific. Right, so the one ring is put on the stack, but unfortunately for Simon, it is sent straight to the bin with a counter spell. And instead, uh, Simon's going to have to satisfy a... Uh, well, get, get an O-Stone out instead yep. to satisfy his, uh, his mana requirements for this turn. Boost the power of the construct. And i got to say, my favorite counter spell art as well. 
beautiful. That's look a, at that. That's, yeah, you really are a boomer. Oh, I love it. It's gorgeous. I like the um, the Jace versus Chandra dual decks one. The one where Jace is kind of like sweeping his arm out through the fire. Oh, Looks yeah. Sick, that one is it's, great it's as well. Really, really Big sick. fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, back over to Bart now, who's playing this new Demir control list. A list that, if you are a control enjoyer, I uh, very much recommend you get your eyes on because it's uh, it's got some spice, dude. It's got some real spice in there. Shaldred, Merktide region at the top, but then just a bunch of card draw and counter spells, as yep. Garfield intended. You know it. And yeah, of course, Simon had quite the year um, and did very well at Pro Tour March of the Machine, mm -hmm. making it to the top four. Bart also had an extremely good Pro Tour March of the Machine to re-qualify for this event as well. Also, the 2022 Mox Season 3 winner. All right, so now we're going to see if there is another counter spell. It looks like we have Subtlety and Murktide to be able to pitch if there is that Karn Liberated that ends up getting cast. You know, that is, you know, going to be a must deal with. But that is a two for one here from Bart, so not ideal by any means. Okie okay, dokes, in comes the Construct and snaps off the block. Bart looking to protect his life total here. And here's the really tough part, the tough part about this matchup here with Demir Control against Tron is Tron is just going to be playing a Haymaker every single turn until like there's just no more counter spells to be dealt with. And it looks like Bard has one more piece of interaction. And uh, outside of that, just a couple of one rings, which will come in handy. But Simon also has Ulamog as a follow-up. Well, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, one short right now can go for Karn. It's probably going to get subtletyed, which isn't even a good answer. And then Simon has Ulamog next turn to uh, have uh, his hunger met. Let's run it back. He says, here's the one ring, and this time it is going to resolve, maybe? Yep, looks like it. There's looks nothing like it. in hand. Okay, I thought Nielsen was going to draw a card immediately. He was like, no, no, it's fine. I'll take my okay. time. Okay. I'll take my time. I, I mean, I'm in no rush, he says. <laughs> And it's back now to Bart. Uh, again, I, I do want to uh, recommend the this Demir control deck to your attention, exalted viewers around the world, because especially with the addition of the One Ring, this 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 gives this deck the the breathing room that it needs. Right? Otherwise, it'd be such a tight deck to try to pilot. You'd need your answers to line up so perfectly. Yes. But the One Ring just kind of gives you just a day off, right? Yeah. You're like, I'm going to chill out here and just kind of take stock, draw three cards, and figure out my next move. And uh, it doesn't have a great way of removing the burden counters. Yeah, no, not really. Just playing a second yeah. ring. You know, when you play four of them, that's kind of the automatic get out of ring, <laughs> you know, get out of jail free card, yeah. if you will, um, where the ring won't deal damage to it. But yeah, you said it exactly right. These control decks just aren't able to go one for one removal, play a Teferi Hero of Dominaria, and expect that to win the game anymore. Yeah. Modern has just become a little bit too powerful, powerful for those type of strategies to succeed. So this is kind of the evolution of the control decks. They got to play something extremely powerful like the One Ring. And there's no doubting the power of the One Ring. It's a card that we're going to see a lot of this weekend. Uh, Corey, you mentioned before, over 450 copies, the most played card in the format at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, all very fitting, you know, such a powerful artifact coming and joining us from Middle Earth uh, and making such a huge impact on the modern format. Yeah. So Nielsen now with a hand full. Oh, sorry, excuse me. That's a. Uh, that's. I thought he just drew five cards. I was like, I'm sure he didn't have that many burden <laughs> counters on the ring. But no, no, that was a. Uh, that was an ancient stirrings. But I mean, this hand is stocked from Simon Nielsen right now. It's just going to be Ulamog. Oh Deal boy. With that. Oh <laughs> boy. <laughs> but that is out of town, man. He's like, no, I can go. I can go and get some lunch. Uh, that's that's I've. Yeah, all about the ceaseless hunger? No, no, but the ceaseless hunger. I'm, I'm going to go and get myself some lunch as well. So, I mean, modern has changed quite drastically, but one thing that has not changed, when you play Ulamog the ceaseless, ceaseless hunger, you do that very often and uh, move on and, and sign this. People line. are very, very quick to concede <laughs> when that takes place. My friends, we've got some great news. We've got another quick modern match to show you here. We're going to jump back into the action between Alex von Stanger here and Nico Boni as well. we got all the, all the uh, European superstars coming yeah. out. It's fantastic to see them all. Nico Boni being around a long time as you can see and uh, someone will be very, very familiar to people who have been following the European uh, uh, circuit over the last couple of years. Yep, and a rematch to the Chen I Ichikawa matchup. Mm -hmm. Pretty much similar. You can't change these decks too much. There is the white in this Rhino's deck, so you're playing Leyline Binding, and you are playing more than likely Ardent Plea. 
um, as a little bit of difference. Those aren't necessarily even going to help in this four color matchup um, as Leyline Binding is not really ideal in that scenario. So Nico Boni qualified via the last PT. That's why he's back here again, having another crack at it. Um, Alex von Stanger, on the other hand, won an RCQ over in the States. Okay. Made the trip across the Atlantic, and I'm sure he's glad to be here in sunny Barcelona. All right. It is wonderful to be here in Spain, enjoying the hot weather. Corey has been absolutely loving it. I love the extreme heat. You've Let me just tell been you, really getting into it. I'm just so used to it, you know, being born in North Dakota. Yep. We're known for our heat there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fargo, North Dakota, one of the hottest. Uh, it's right up the north, right? Yes, yes. Really, really hot region of the United States. Super hot. Yeah. So he's come over here and he's he's loving it. But uh, <laughs> no, look. In all seriousness, um, you know, having the pro tour have international stops outside of the United States. It's been yeah. a joy for me uh, personally, someone who was on, you know, the European competitive circuit years ago yeah. as, as a commentator. Back at it, man. Back at it. One of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen in my life. Well, as someone Barcelona. from Fargo, North Dakota, hey, imagine yeah. my surprise. Second, <laughs> second best city, Barcelona. Fargo, North Dakota. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. No, this right. is an incredible city. I absolutely love yeah. being here uh, for the second time. Last time I was playing. Last time you were playing, but this time <laughs> in the booth with me. And we're so glad to have him. Corey Baumeister, Riley Knight, in the booth here at Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. And it's great to have you along as we get stuck into this next match here. Uh, game number two, Nico Boney, the Swiss player, on Four Color Rhinos. We've already seen Four Color Omnath opening up with a delighted halfling here for Von Stanger. But I want, I want you to talk to us now about the Rhinos list, right? We yes. talked about the fact that some of these lists are playing white cards. They're playing mm -hmm. Ardent Plea. They're playing... Um, Leyline Leyline binding. binding as yep. well. So let's talk about the dimension that, that that opens. Yeah, a little bit different here. You have a lot less of the counter spells, for instance. Maybe we don't have those main deck disputes, those kind of fringe sideboard cards that not everyone is playing. They're replaced with two copies of Ardent Plea and this enchantment, it does have Exalted and do that, which comes into play almost never because it is going to cascade into Crashing Footfalls, which is two creatures. Two creatures. But it can come up in some corner case scenarios where you only want to attack with one or one dies. But the main point of it, it is just the ninth and 10th Cascade card to be able to uh, affect the battlefield here. Stomp is going to take care of the Delighted Halfling. Yep, and here is Teferi, the most important card in this matchup, and one of the most important Planeswalkers, if not the most imp important Planeswalker in this Pro Tour. Oh, dude, absolutely. Yeah, dealing with these uh, Cascade effects straight away, where, you know, if you just tick up with these Teferis and get it out of range of cards like Fury or Fire being able to deal damage to it, Stomp to be able to finish it off, it's just undeal with the bolt. I mean, now the Leyline Bindings are there to clear the way, so that is a bit of an advantage here um, with this version. I think Alex is still thinking about where this, this Teferi is going. Upstairs, downstairs, ends up being downstairs here, and back now to Nico, who I don't think has a third land. Okay. Oh, no, he does. Nope. He does, he does. He and does. the Cascade. And now we're going to see Crashing Footfalls, thanks to this Shardless Agent. Three mana, ten power. Easy peasy. There it is. And it looks like I saw the one of Hollowed Moonlight in the sideboard going to be a little brutal because, well, Alex had the decision to say go or go for Teferi. Subtlety doesn't do anything to Hollowed Moonlight, but Hollowed Moonlight does do something to Crashing Footfall. I don't think you can fault that play, man. You've I can't got, either. I, you've got the Teferi, you jam it. Yep. Like, it just shuts down the... Uh, the Rhino's deck so comprehensively that if it hits the battlefield, you're in such a good spot. So unfortunate for Alex to have taken that uh, um, that angle of attack mm -hmm. against Nico Boney's Rhinos. But at the end of the day, you can't win them all. We're going to see a prismatic ending here. Yep. Take care of one of the Rhinos. And that's a lot of the corner cases in Modern is most of the time there's two cards they could have. They could yep. have Force and Negation, they could have Subtlety, and you just kind of have to guess. You can have some educated guess, like, oh, there's already Six. one Subtlety in the graveyard, so mathematically I should go for the, you know, right. those type of things. But in the end of the day... Oh, if you're a nerd, you can do that. Otherwise, you can just... You know what I like to trust? Huh. My gut, dude. Your gut? Yeah. yeah. That gut. Hey, that's why you're here in the booth there, buddy, that's instead it. of playing. <laughs> 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 All right, let's see what Nico's going to do to, to, to defend his position. He's got that subtlety in hand, which is going to be very nice. Fire Ice as well. And we saw the efficacy of Ice in just mm. tapping down the land. This is a mana-hungry deck. Sure. This Omnath deck, like, it needs its mana. And yep. so if you can upkeep, tap something down, all of a sudden you might... It's, it can effectively feel like a Time Orc sometimes. Absolutely. And Fire yeah. used to be a lot better... Um, yeah, and here we go. We see another ice. Fire used to be a lot better when Regavan was a bit of a bigger player, but yeah. that card definitely lost a lot of stock, even though it's 
one of, if not the most powerful yes. one drop maybe ever printed, but with Orcish Bowmaster and Ren, like you were making a point to earlier, uh, that card amount has declined. So there we see the upkeep ice tapping down the triome. And back over to Nico Boney now, who is just going to get in for another six. It's, it's up to Alex to do something, right? Like, Nico can just sit here and be like, I got six power, man. You have to deal with this, otherwise, you're going to. Exactly. Home. And we do see two Ley Lines bindings, uh, Delighted Halfling, Omnath, and Hollowed Moonlight in the hand there for Alex. So, interesting to not fire off any Ley Line binding, but really was hoping to get value out of that Hollowed Moonlight. Bernie G from the Exile Zone now, from the Adventure Zone, comes in. And here now is Leyline Binding. And here's another scenario where you can look, be like, wow, you should have did that earlier yep. because, you know, they, they didn't Leyline. cast sure. the Cascade thing. Well, Nico had it. Nico had the Cascade. Yeah. So Sorry. if Alex yeah. went for this line <laughs> before damage, all of a sudden you're dealing with 10 power here instead of, or excuse me, only 8 because it's a Violent Outburst instead of a Shardless Agent. But still, you know, Nico had both options and played around whichever scenario Alex went for. Yep. Yep. Play at the highest level here. And we had another look. Alex there had a, had a quick read of Bone Crusher Giant to make sure that he wasn't going to take two from it uh, when he cast his uh, Leyline Binding. It doesn't. Uh, Bone Crusher Giant only triggers when it's the target of a spell, not an ability. Yep. And uh, interesting here, Alex did have the ability to play Omnath, right? White, red, green, blue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zagoth Triumph can make blue. Had the option, but didn't want to fumble into a possible subtlety, yeah. which Nico has. You know, I love these little intricate lines and uh, magic at the highest level for modern. Well, this also allows him to leave Hallowed Moonlight up. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're playing around two things here. You're playing around your opponent having something to deal with your Omnath, which you did. Yeah. And you're also playing around your opponent just untapping and slamming another Cascade spell onto the But Oh, boy! Oh, baby! That was a huge draw because as it stands... But check this out. Check this out. In response, right, we cast the, the Violent Outburst. That's an now instant. we have the Hallowed Moonlight. But the hell is the Hallowed Moonlight in hand for Alex? Look at that. And even with uh, the Crashing uh, Footfalls off the top, Hallowed Moonlight cycles, gets rid of these Rhinos as well. But <laughs> as it stands, it looks like there's going to have to be a chump block next turn with the Delighted Halfling because you can just cast Violent Outburst, not worry about the Cascade, get in there for three points of damage. <laughs> just use it as the world's worst combat trick. Yes. But this is an incredible turnaround here for Alex, trying to keep himself in this game. Chalice on zero, Hallowed Moonlight to prevent the Rhinos. So here it's going to be the very interesting scenario if Alex has the Soul Read to one, not attack with this Delighted Halfling, and two, to actually block here. If not... Nico is going to pick this up 2-0, and it's not very heads up by any means that you should block this. Mate, are we going to see Violent Outburst uh, used yeah. as a plus one, plus oh uh, uh, combat one. trick on a single creature for yeah. lethal? Okay, so had the land, drew the land off Hollowed Moonlight to play Omnath, and yes. subtlety oh to finish it off. And that's it. So we now have the Shardless Agent attacking across for lethal. Corey... That was an incredible match, so, incredible game there from, to close out that match. That was really incredible because like at each stage of the game, there was like six different lines that each player could have taken. So you look at the end of the game and you're like, ah, I really should have done that. I really should have done that. But, you know, there was the counterplay to the opposite line if they went for it. So really showcases how many decisions you have in an average model. Well, it's what, it's what you said before, right? You can try to play around one thing, you get blown out by the other. Yeah. You try to play about around this thing, and they've got another answer, another line. Modern's a very intricate format. It's a yes. decision-heavy format. Yes. It's a skill-testing format. And we've only just begun coverage of it for the weekend. We are so pleased you've chosen to join us here in Barcelona. We cannot wait to bring you more of modern from Spain. But right now, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back very shortly from Pro 2 of the Lord of the Rings. Stay with us.